Today we have uh, what I'm sure is going to be a, a fascinating talk by Professor Jeff Whetstone, who is a professor, professor of visual arts in, in the Lewis Center. Uh, he's a photographer and a filmmaker, and uh, his photographs and films uh, often focus on rural America with a variety of interesting themes, including gender, geography, and heritage and how these are used to represent the position of humans in the natural world. Uh, he uh, has uh, an interesting background in that his undergraduate degree is in zoology. He then moved on to uh, creative arts. So he has this really interesting mix that, that uh, I always find fascinating in a place like Princeton, where somehow these amazing people tend to come with a mix of, of science and art to really address uh, uh, topics that, that we're all interested in. Uh, his work has been exhibited uh, widely, uh, internationally. It's been reviewed in the New York Times, the New Yorker, the LA Times, and many other places. He's received uh, a number of prizes, including the George Segier Prize for Excellence in Photography from Yale University, the Factor Prize for Southern Art, and he's received a Guggenheim Fellowship. And today he's going to tell us about some of his work related to the Lower Mississippi uh, in, uh, in terms of his visual art. So please join me in welcoming Jeff Weston. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Um, I'm so glad to be here. It's, a, it's a really an honor to come here and speak in front of PEI, and it's a, a real testament to uh, your engagement across the disciplines, and uh, I'm, I'm really honored. And I I'd really like to thank um, Catherine Hackett, who has, been, uh, who has really helped me put a class together through PEI, and of course, Morgan, whose birthday is today, I found out. <laughs> um, so, um, let me get this lighting right. We're going to get a little mood lighting here. Um, before I start, since I'm an artist coming in here, I w I'd like to talk a little bit about my approach and methodology and, and like kind of how I do my research, my work. And so I'll start with this. This doesn't have anything to do with Louisiana, but it does have to do with, um, I guess, metaphor and uh, the metaphor between humans and nature. So. Uh, um, there was a, a zoologist, Thomas Say, in the, in the 19th century, um, who went across the South and, the, and into the West uh, doing a lot of taxonomy and a lot of categorization of animals. Um, and this animal is called Alafe obsoleta, and the, the, the piece is a 16 millimeter film piece uh, that's called Drawing E. obsoleta. And so uh, Thomas Say named it obsolete, and he was using obsolete in a more of a scientific way than a, in a vernacular way, not meaning that it's no longer needed, but it's meaning that it's kind of a redundant. There's a, there's a redundancy to this animal. And in a, in a, in a notebook, he put, uh, it's a black rat snake. You know, this animal is widespread and unremarkable. Uh, which kind of pissed me off when I read it. I don't really know why, but um, so I went and caught one and I put it in this vessel that I lit and, and manipulated uh, uh, with light to make it seem like a piece of paper. And so the art conceit of it was I was going to remove this animal from its habitat and then draw the landscape from which I removed the animal with the animal in, in some kind of shamanistic art way to reconnect the animal and, it, and its habitat. Well, you know, it's completely uninterested in my art endeavor and all it wants to really do is, depending on the temperature, is either kind of lay there or get out. And so, um, um, but I thought that there was this kind of a documentary of sorts of, of non-collaboration and, and, uh, and, and it forms a metaphor that I think is important to keep in mind about the human's attempt to control nature or maybe the, 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 a human attempt to control an animal or maybe even the attempt of an artist to control a line. Maybe even what the creative practice is about. It spills over and you corral it back in, and it spills over and you corral it back in. So, 
And all of this is done with 16 millimeter film, which is completely obsolete, right? And drawing, which is kind of obsolete. And maybe even animals are obsolete. Maybe landscapes are obsolete. But they're in no way unremarkable. So um, with that, I'm going to start. Um, so PEI, let's see, I'm going to have to do a little move here. Let's go here, get out of this, go here. Um, let's see if this works. Okay, so when I, was, um, when I was researching for the class that I just taught through a PEI initiative uh, about southern Louisiana, I came across these Harold Fisk maps in the 1940s that were done through the U.S. Corps of Army, Army Engineers of the uh, past routes of the Mississippi River. And I was really reminded of that piece, uh, of that drawing obsolete piece. So I thought it was a good intro into to some more of my work. Now, I, I, I did study zoology, and it wasn't just a, a, a thing to get, a, you know, to get my major. It was really a mindset that I cannot escape, and I've never escaped it. I was studying zoology when I was a child, and, I was, uh, and I'm still a lay zoologist or lay bi biology, and meaning that when I see a landscape, I see a collection of, of territorial markers, and I see an eco ecological system and niches. And when I see a human, I am very aware of like the instincts that are simmering beneath uh, a cultural animal. Maybe culture itself is an instinct. So I go through my photography looking at, oops, looking at, um, at places uh, and landscapes where um, ecology and the human endeavor are butted together. And so let's go back to 1870. Uh, and I discovered these, these pictures when I was at Yale as a, as a graduate student. These are Timothy O'Sullivan. These are the first, very first pictures of the American West. So if we think landscape, the thing that comes into your mind is Generally, uh, for a lot of people, for a lot of Americans, the West. And um, so photography was a brand new tool. It was a new technological innovation that was factual, that was scientific. It wasn't art. It was, uh, it was some kind of science. So the U.S. government actually sent photographers west to basically see what we were spending so much energy, uh, you know, uh, destroying, you know, peoples and uh, advancing west what did it really look like well we had an idea this was also done in 1870 by Bierstadt of what the west looked like right so you know it looks like the promised land so it really folds into manifest destiny that the landscape is there to be um, is, is there to be occupied um, but Timothy O'Sullivan's pictures were very different so this is one of his western images now, this is factual information, but it is in no way truth, right? So imagine the opinions getting formed here by the camera, like a Western photographer with a vast, vast horizon line chooses to turn the camera into portrait mode, right? And to, not, to make the horizon line kind of um, inconsequential and really photograph something that's aggressive and in your face and an and, and obstacle, right? He does, it, he does it every time. Look at this one. So we're seeing early on photography as an opinion and that the landscape is a, and a, this is another Timothy O'Sullivan landscape of the West, this ghostly figure in, 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 the, in, the, in the background. Um, so this, this, narrative that he's making of the West is one of an obstacle. So we're, now we're seeing like the landscape is not something to record, but it's something to project upon. Um, this is by Will William Henry Jackson, same year, 1870. Uh, this is Mountain of the Holy Cross, in which in Colorado there is a mountain of the Holy Cross that if the humidity is just perfect and everything lines up, a cross forms, which was taken as evidence for manifest destiny. It did not form this day. Uh, he had to fake it. He had a 1870s Photoshop, uh, the, the right arm and the lower part of it. But it does form, 
You know, so it's kind of like here's another person manually projecting an idea on the landscape. So these were, and, and then we look at Ansel Adams, like 1950. What ideas is he projecting on the landscape? He's not just recording the Grand Tetons. You know, this is an America that has arrived out of a war that was won, and so these pictures project this, you know, awesome pride. And, and I've been a little suspect, I love Ansel Adams and what he's contributed to photography, but I'm always uh, suspect of these pictures because it is a wilderness outside of ourselves, to me. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's something outside of ourselves. And something that Henry David Thoreau said was, it is vain to dream of a wilderness outside of ourselves. It is the bog in our brains and bowels, the primitive nature the primitive vigor of nature in us that inspires that dream. And so I took these cameras that they used in the 1870s and 1950s and tried to mimic the styles and create what I call like a new wilderness. What is the wilderness? What's wild? This is a flock of seagulls that um, landed on a hot pile of iron ore and they leave every morning, and they come every day. And there's something wild about that, and something that's very, very cultural about it. How did I get that one? Um, this is a shooting target in um, a, what is it? I guess it's Bureau of Land Management area in Utah that mimics its own landscape. Uh, this is in Beblin, South Dakota. You know. American bison. So my interest was looking at what is wild, but not what is in a park, not, not something that's preserved and in some kind of bubble of a token of some existence that we lived a long time ago, but what is wild now and what is wild in the future. And where I go to find these places I think is really um, important. And these are places that are, you might think of them as commons, but they're really not commons. They're really places that are unimprovable, uncapitalizable. They are the remnants of a, a, an economy. They're, they can't be owned. Um, so um, I started painting. In, um, no, I'm just kidding. This is Bro <laughs> this is Bruegel. This is uh, 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 Bruegel the Elder, uh, and there's something very important about his work and how it deals with landscape. And I'll just go over it briefly. He, through the landscape and through his lens of painting, tells the story of a culture. So it's the wheat harvest, and it looks like it's the women's job to gather the wheat, and men cut it. And wheat, I love that there's a jar of water being kept cool in the wheat, maybe from the sun. Uh, and wheat gives us bread and porridge uh, and probably beer is what, how I interpret that. Uh, and then, but the, 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 the real picture happens in the landscape, and I love this tree, but he indicates, hey, look over here with these two high contrast birds of these people taking the wheat to that wagon. The wagon goes down the road to that ship that ship sails all the way over there, and it comes back with the money to buy our church, a school. There's leisure. He's painting a whole culture, a whole economy. He's kind of like a documentary artist, but he's doing it for uh, the future, I guess. Here's another one of his, his um, paintings. Uh, this is the Hunters. I'm not going to go into that, but what I think is interesting about his work is where he positions his viewpoint. It's kind of... 20 feet high. It's not all the way in the sky like God looking down, and it's not common stance like a man. It's the, it's, it's the viewpoint of an om omniscient human narrator. And I took that viewpoint on and I kind of applied it to places that are um, these places that are interstitial. So this is an unimprovable place. This is the strip, this is a strip mine, strip coal mine in Kentucky that nothing can ever be built on right now or, or probably ever because it is unimprovable. And so these places are, are, are in some strange way a free wilderness where 
there's, there's no property owners per se, and no one's caring for the land or protecting it. And it's being what it is. And this is right near there. This is Kentucky, uh, where my wife and I, Ste uh, Stephanie, lived for a while. And the thing about Kentucky is really interesting. I think it's that the landscape forms the people. And, and that happens in a lot of different places, but we think of like, oh, we, we're people, we got bulldozers, we can do whatever we want to the land, but the land also forms us. For instance, in Kentucky, there's very little pl place to find purchase to build a house. So ha land is aired, because the flat land is aired to, to sons and daughters and nieces and nephews and grandsons, and so grandsons and granddaughters, so people live close together in these narrow little hollows, hollers. And so a familiar stereotype uh, arises from that, uh, from the land clustering people. You know, people are clannish, wary, hillbillies, right? So the land is instrumental in our perceptions, but what also is going on is the land's very rich. So this is, this is a strip mine, coal mine extraction. So that mountain is gone, and it was gone six months after I took the picture. Um, now, if it wasn't for the mineral wealth in the land, those stereotypes wouldn't be so prevalent, right? Because those stereotypes determine who is dispensable and what kind of landscapes are dispensable. So the, the, the minerals under the land set up a hierarchy of who lives on the land. Um, So really quickly, I'm not gonna belabor this much. These pictures were taken on the same, in the same year. This is from the uh, US Corps of Army Engineers of a flooded, of a valley that was getting ready to flood in Tennessee, and this was taken a family photo. And they tell very different stories. We have to have these pictures, right? Because it's data. I mean, this is what you, this is what you can analyze for data. But they kind of don't tell the full story of who was moved off the land for this, for this, uh, for, for that, uh, that dam and that uh, consequent flooding. And so this, this common stance where there's space forms a narrative, right? Um, so, and this is where that house is now. There's a big bridge pillar. Uh, so <laughs> same sites, same year, you know, 50 years at a time. So um, let's get on into um, let's get on into the work. Okay. So um, I put all these pictures in to kind of reinforce the sites that I search for are land that is interstitial, unowned, and a byproduct of our commodity. So I'm up on a, I'm a banded strip job here. Uh, these caves are abandoned saltpeter caves from the Civil War. This is, an, uh, this is the Bureau of Land Management area. And uh, which brings us to this work I did in Louisiana. And so the work that I did I went down there with the idea of addressing an incredible crisis, the fastest land loss in the world, probably, uh, of southern Louisiana, an incredible crisis that was brought to fore in, in the conscious of the world with Hurricane Katrina 13 years ago. Um, and um, I s ended up studying the Batcher. And the Batcher is spelled B-A-T-T-U-R-E. It's a French word that is never, I can never find any place in, any reference to it being used in France. It's really used in lower Louisiana and it's pronounced Batcher. It's a creolized French word, which means this. It's the space between the levee, which are 22 feet high in New Orleans, and the river. It's a little strip that floods five, six times a year. Maybe it'll stay flooded for six months. Maybe it won't flood the whole year. It, it's, it's a completely unimprovable, uncapitalizable piece of land that no one owns and no one takes care of. And that's where I work. This is a levee. When the, when the water's high, you're actually below the ships. 
which is a very strange idea. And this is what the bachelor looks like. It's filled with pioneer species, vines, bachelor willows, trees that grow really fast and can uh, kind of mang, they're not really mangrove trees, but kind of trees that act like mangroves that can stick their roots anywhere and grow really fast and, and, and um, survive uh, destruction. And so where is, um, so this is all the levees on the Mississippi River and the Batcher is, the Batcher is between these two levees. So um, I taught a class uh, and I did a lot of research on Southern Louisiana and, and this is what basically, uh, and I'm not gonna go into that because I assume so many people are scientists that they know a lot more about this than I do, but I did spend a lot of time the causes of land, uh, studying about the causes of land loss in southern Louisiana. And basically, there's a lot of causes, but one major cause is the levee system pulls the water from the Mississippi River and drains it into the deep parts of the Gulf of Mexico. So that, that, that periodic flooding that happens, it should happen two or, two or three times a year, that pours tons of sediment into this, into this area is gone and, uh, because we need that river for ship traffic. Um, the result, the direct result is a devastating, uh, you know, a devastating flood that, of Katrina of a rather, uh, you know, once it hit New Orleans, it was a rather a small hurricane, but it pushed so much water uh, into uh, this canal right here and this canal that that's where the big break was and then it broke all all along uh, Lake Pontchartrain and so how do you see this on the ground how do you see a climate change that is a, a geologic era uh, happening even though it's kind of a fast one on that scale very slow one on on human scale uh, how do you see it how do you see it? Well, mainly we see it from above on to, to see a kind of a global perspective. And these global perspectives we've seen for 30 or 40 years of polar ice caps and, and, and what have you. And that, that kind of visual information is critical for study. It's, it's, it's critical data. But it's not evocative, or apparently it's not evocative because we're, we're accelerating at a faster acceleration rate, right? So. It, we're not slowing down. So is there another way to see, to, to see this? And so here's, this is one of the most Im important places in New Orleans. This is where the levees broke. Uh, it doesn't look like much. This was a, a, a cypress swamp, you know, 60 years ago, but due to saltwater incursions that died, this is our class. This is the site of, the, you know, the most devastating, uh, uh, weather event in America in the last, I don't know, 100 years, but it's called the, they call it in, the, in New Orleans, the end of the world. Um, but it doesn't, how can you tell? And then this is the subsequent Army Corps of Engineers solution for this is building the largest water pump in the world. And this water pump, uh, each one of these engines is the size of a diesel engine that drives a super max cargo ship. And it, what this water pump does is drains this, and it can drain this whole, uh, this, uh, this whole canal system, quote, down to the mud in two days. So it can just drain it so that, the, so that New Orleans can pump water back into the river and it'll finally go out these drainage ditches. But again, how does that tell you the story? I try to tell the story through how people are adapting to this through their homes around southern Louisiana. Um, and either, even some kind of habitual adaptation to fishing in flooded water. Um, never wanting to lose sight of the fact that New Orleans is a great place for art and music and to have a good time, but really when it comes down to the end of the day, it's a global industrial city that is a artery and a vein for our resource extraction, for grain, for the, everything that has to do with corn and grain in the Midwest and the, uh, the oil and gas all over the world. So back to the Batcher. These are the images 
that I kind of came up with as not as documentary evidence of what's happening, but really as a metaphor for um, a new wilderness and a possible future. And a future that <laughs> can look kind of bleak, but a future that uh, has some of the some of the, the the codes that we need to read about climate change and about our future. You know, incredible industry and the industry of people, right? So. As I narrowed my focus, I became obsessed with a tree, one tree on the Mississippi River, and that I photographed and documented this tree for, two, for on and off for two years. It was my site that I went to every day. I paid homage to this batcher willow, which is a trash tree, as the locals call it. You know, it's just a fast growing tree that uh, can survive flood. Uh, it's almost like a mangrove. And I photographed this tree and filmed the tree incessantly. And I wonder why, it's something very beautiful about it. it I photographed it at night. I photographed activity around the tree. Uh, it was a site where people gathered. And it was also a site where you could see the economy go by. I thought about, like, what is it with this tree? And, I, I, of course, I went right to... Bruegel's, this is the ship of fools, right? This is ship, ship of the fools, and the ship of fools, the fools cut down the tree of life and used it as a mast to go nowhere, right? So, uh, you know, that, that allegory is very important, I think, and very connected to our current state of our environment. And then there's, of course, um, uh, Bruegel's, the fall of Icarus, I think was one of the great, another great painting. You know, the guy's plowing this field so tenderly, and this guy's looking up into the sky, tending his sheep. No, Icarus is down here. He's not, and it's not really like, you know, it's not really a big deal. So somebody flies too far, far from the sun, you know, he's not from around here. Um, <laughs> and I love, I love it. Like, there's this fisherman here, you know, like with a, with a fisherman and a bone. There's these guys, they finally caught some wind, they're going to go do some trade. Uh, so, and, and there's this, you know, these Bruegel's scraggly trees. And so these were the kind of guides that I took to, take, to try to make this metaphor about climate change. And now I'm going to show you a little bit of, I'll shut up for a second. We'll talk about the movie a little bit. Um, I, I might talk over it, but let me do my, my magic on my computer screen. This is, um, this is, uh, the
so this film is 24 minutes long and it's supposed to represent kind of a day in the life of a tree um, it's filmed over a couple of years inter, 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 interspersed over a couple of years but in each shot there's a few things in common till the end I guess is that there's activity on the shore there's a comparison of the foreground and the background there is a comparison of scales of economy right the economy of global capitalism going by every single minute and every single day on the Mississippi River and then there's the scale of a much smaller economy people actually fishing for food uh, fishing for their food for their families or the communities and actually fishing to sell food too uh, so there's this real economy that's happening at this tree there's also uh, people we kind of can't really see but may identify as immigrants uh, but they're in fact well they are Vietnamese but she was born here Hong was born here uh, and after her family came over from the Vietnam War and then there's the tree which plays a character that doesn't the way it acts is it draws people it draws people throughout the film to uh, to this site so we're in, in before this and the film's got this soundtrack that I play really really loud it's in New York right now at a gallery in Chelsea uh, to make you this is a kind of a quiet part because the, the 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 boats aren't going by to make you understand that with all the romantic light and backlight and the Mississippi River and all its connotations of romance that we are in an this is an industrial site that happens to there's some nature that happens to be forgotten and discarded and it's growing right um, so um, so this film uh, kind of goes starts at dawn and ends at the next dawn uh, as it as I play it out so um, let's I'm going to escape this and kind of sum it up here a little bit uh, let's go back to let's see I'm going to cut you off by um, we'll, we'll see a little bit more of the film in a minute but I want to go back to to PowerPoint and uh, um, let's just do this um, um, it was so interesting to be here and to kind of live there and actually be a part of a very diverse group of community people uh, of co uh, a very diverse group I won't call them a community but people who use the site to fish who use the site uh, and, and I feel like I was witnessing something that was you know um, very very ancient while I was also w witnessing something very very contemporary um, it's funny the, the the way the work kind of e evolved and that there became uh, I would say a spiritual aspect to the site and I think that was really on purpose because I was <laughs> trying my best to make some kind of um, propaganda about our present and that the batcher is, an, is a metaphor for a new kind of wilderness that we can expect in the future. It is now and it is a documentary but the batcher is not threatened or in jeopardy in any way because it's, it's, it's a no place. It's completely flooded and, and always it never reaches an equilibrium, right? And in that I found a metaphor for our possible existence and to, to, to bring that kind of propaganda, that, that bring that thought to fore, it, it, the, the images have to kind of strike something that images about data sometimes don't or often don't um, so um, 
the meth heads cut down the tree while I was there. Yeah, <laughs> it was devastating. I mean, you couldn't believe it. I like sank into a month long depression. I was like, oh, well, I guess my project's over now. Uh, you know, and uh, it was a territorial, uh, there was a little territorial skirmish and they came out and cut down the tree. Uh, it didn't stop people from fishing, but it just made it just uh, another crappy side on the Mississippi River to fish from. Um, it killed my Bruegel met, uh, you know, connection. And my, my, but uh, but um, I thought I had to put this picture in just to make sure that you know that there's nothing permanent here. It's always being cut down. It's always being flooded down. Sometimes the river cuts it down. Um, I want to go back to Bruegel for a second. And um, um, he records his presence with a message for the future. And I think this is, this, the message might be this. You know, we can work together. Can, we can have leisure together. We can be together. And we can be stewards for a land that will provide for us. Right? Um, we can have the things we want and be together as a people. And, you know, I don't want to... Um, I don't want to compare myself to Bruegel, you know, but I do feel that Bruegel is a guide in this way, and that, that Bruegel is a um, Bruegel is a concerned artist, um, and that's what I purport to be—a concerned artist that uh, that tries to look not for solutions but for metaphors that people can use to um, do better with our land. And um, I'm going to play this a little bit while I, I, I talk and kind of come to a conclusion. Like I said, the Batcher is not in jeopardy. It's never in equilibrium. And it's not really a concern for us. But it is a metaphor and it can look like the future. It's what I would call the new wilderness. This thin strip of scraggly trees all pioneer species, don't really form a dividing line, but actually a magnet that draws together, the, it draws in contact all manner of animals and industry. It pulls together what, you know, what we can call the unstoppable force and the unmovable object. One being global capitalism and trade and profit, and the other being what, Dar what, what Thoreau described, the innate and encoded drive that pulls people to a frontier, to some sort of wilderness, to find some kind of sustenance, however they describe that. Thank you very much. All right, run the class if you need to, but I'll st stay for questions, as many as you like. And if your questions have to do with the dynamics of southern Louisiana landscape, I'm, I can answer those too, so. Yeah. Thank you, hey. Jeff. Hey. Fantastic talk, but, you know, I, I don't know, I felt some very profound things there when your, your images came up. And one of the things I felt was this kind of um, recognition that we're at some, some new point where, say, the logic of preservation no longer applies. You have to sort of embrace, you have to kind of embrace what's happening um, and accept it. And I was interested in your kind of, you know, invocation of the road, too. But I was wondering how you do kind of square with, say, that desire to get to the frontier wilderness, including like, his writings on Katage. It's like, you know, sort of that desire to get in contact with just raw nature, nature that's untrammeled by any contact with you. And I mean, that's kind of like, are you kind of like positing that that's 
done over that. In fact, that's, that's kind of that whole logic is is flawed mm -hmm. as a way to sort of approach the crisis that we're in. Well, a couple of things. Uh, I am totally a proponent of saving some what's left or s some things that are left, but not at, you know, but also like, let's look at what's there. Like, what about these weeded lots? You know, what about the, this, uh, you know, the, where I grew up, like the rhododendron grove behind the Dollar General store parking lot. Like, what about these parts of nature? And I think if we can kind of train ourselves to have some kind of romantic attitude toward those, it might even go further than to like have a, a, a grand political statement of saving the, the Brooks Range in Alaska, right? Both are needed. Uh, but, you know, I, uh, I guess what, what comes to mind is I, I had this great friend uh, who was a great artist whose past is Kimwan Mechewas McLean, and he was a Cree Indian from northern Alberta. And uh, we were walking around one day, you know, like in the trails behind the parking lot, and he says, you know, there's no Cree word for nature. I was like, what, what is nature? It's an invention uh, that that we, we, you know, culture came before nature, right? Um, so I'm not like anti-nature, but I think Thoreau about the, the nature within ourselves and our accepting our, um, you know, our yearning for profit and this, this territorialism, I think if we accept that as nature, maybe we can do a lot of, to stem the tide. But I mean, factually, the, 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 the atmosphere has changed, and so it's not even the Brooks Range has changed. Methane's escaping from those. Is that nature? I don't know if there is a place anymore, so we have to find it in, 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 um, in around us. It's my kind of like uh, proselytizing or you know, evan evangelical stance for it. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Well, in these levees in southern Louisiana, are, um, they don't provide a buffer. I mean, there's a little bit of a buffer, but it's not enough. But it's a tiny bit of a buffer. The, the, what, what the conversation generally, to generalize an entire region, but the conversation about levees are, it's a contentious topic to everyone you talk about. So there are these there are those who propose to, we need to destroy the levees 50 miles south of New Orleans, retreat, let the Mississippi do its thing, build a storm buffer for the city and for the port. Uh, and then they're like, no, we can't destroy the levees because we live here. And if we destroy the levees, we have to move. Uh, who's going to move us? And so these levees, and, you know, they're political. They have been destroyed. They, you know, they were destroyed in 1927 uh, by the government. They were blown open to let the 1927 floodwaters flood a poor community. So um, I think where in these zones, what is kind of sad about the place is, you know, New Orleans is, you know, the Crescent City and the Crescent's the river, right? It's hard to get to the river. It's walled off, you know, like I guess Trump wants to do with like Mexico is a 25 foot high wall that you can't climb. You can't access the river in so many points. I mean, these are kind of little secret places. And um, it really separates people from the river that define the city. I was at this um, kind of uh, 
funeral or memorial service for someone who died. And uh, it was led by a woman, Sabrina Mays, who, who uh, practices Yorban Euro, um, religious practices. And one of them is to, to go to the river and pour water in the river, uh, Ashe, you know, to, to, to give the water back to the ancestors. Well, we went on this long march, you know, went through town with a second line parade, and we got to the wall, and that was it poured water on the ground. The wall was there. The river was divided. So, so these, it, 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 the river is unloved by people because it's walled off by people. I think what you're talking about is people accepting its, it, it, these, these floodplains as a, as a real cycle, but not so much in southern Louisiana. So does that answer your question? Yeah, OK. Hi. Um, I grew up in rural, rural America, and um, I touched on it a lot of the followers. And um, I was really curious, like, how were you able to get these people's trust? Because I know where I grew up, saying you're coming from the end, and I'm saying that it's here. In fact, I've told people when I walk back home, yeah, I'm a person, they're like, what's that? Like, they've never heard it, and if you start explaining, they're like, do you think you're fancy? Like, so how are you? <laughs> so you brought up about 10 interesting points. I'm going to attack a couple of them. For one, I, you know, I grew up, I speak nine dialects of redneck, so I can kind of like, <laughs> but, but seriously, no, my method is I lay it on the line. I'm like an evangelist for a contemporary art, and I say, listen, I'm an artist. Here's what I'm doing, and it's like I'll kind of try to wade through that. What? I, why are you an artist down here? And I say, you know, you know I'm paying it, you know, I, I, here's what my, the results of this are going to be, hopefully, and this is what I do. And, and you know, I don't gain everyone's trust for sure, but I, uh, I do gain a lot of trust. So going out into the woods, I grew up in rural America, so fear. Now, I spent my whole youth afraid of the Lowry boys, right, who were like lived, you know, about a half a mile from us. So my ventures into the woods were all about fear. And so I kind of think that I'm going to stop this right now because I want to go back to a picture that uh, uh, um, if I can tell this story really quickly, um, this picture here. Yeah. Uh, um, so I um, have this giant camera on a tripod and all this gear and I'm walking, you know, with my boots and waders and stuff trying to find some kind of thing and I come across this chair and immediately I got scared. I just got, I was like, ooh, and I was like, why am I, and so zoology mind was like, oh, I'm having a fear response, you know, I'm having all like hackles on my neck and I'm like, I'm hearts racing, and I'm like, well, why am I having a fear response? This is actually kind of beautiful. And then I, I realized it was, it, was, it was this. And I was like, oh, wow, somebody threw all their trash on the ground, and like, it doesn't make me mad, it makes me scared. And then I was like, ah, oh, it's not trash. It's a territorial marker. And what they're communicating to me is like, your liberal art, attitude in this space. This is not a state park. So you are not protected and neither is this land and it's my territory. It's my fishing hole. And so once I understood that, the, 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 the picture started making sense. So I think fear indicates, you know, the wilderness. I mean, the scary, I mean, the levees are kind of scary too back in southern, in, in the southern part of Orleans Parish. You know, you have to kind of like you know, the meth heads come and cut down the trees. You know, it's, it's scary, so. <laughs> so, you're right to be afraid. <laughs> yes? I'm curious about the uh, uh, termination of your idea of uh, making the film that you made, how you made it uh, to portray uh, your message or your ideas. Uh, I think you agree it's not at all what I call, 
Yeah. Well, point taken. And um, I mean, I guess that's somewhat the indulgence of a talk. But also, I think if you take the work, you know, my work over my career, you can point to a little bit more of a direct relationship to the, some of the points I want to convey, and not just the film. However, I think the film, I don't want to spell out a, 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 a um, literal and didactic, um, it was never my uh, desire to spell out a literal and didactic um, documentary about climate change per se. There are a lot of those. Tons of them. Um, I don't know what I watch them. I get mad. Uh, you know, I you know drive to the convenience store. And, <laughs> you know, I, it, I don't know if it, in, it if it affects me. So what I wanted to make was something that was meditative, that was you sat in front of for a long time, that was, and and maybe even some times a little boring, but that had an effect of reflection on the role, what we're really up against. And we're not up against, I mean, I don't know, I, I try to recycle my straws and stuff, but the ships are giant. The will to face them and to fish and to grab those fish, no matter how, how tainted they are, is giant. It doesn't look big, but it is big. And to bring these two together in this, in this kind of, in, in a structure that you can not make a point with, but hopefully that you can um, be evoked by, something evocative about it. Well, thank you. I will say that I did make the other film. I decided this film was due, had a due date, and I decided I had so much footage that I was just going to do it by math. I was going to edit for 100 hours. I was going to spend 100 hours in the editing chair, and at the end of the 100 hours, I threw the other film away and came up with this one, right? So it was kind of like, it was a leap of faith, but it was really a labor of... Uh, get it done, you know, more. <laughs> All right. One, one more question. Uh, yeah. Um, hey, I have a question about um, the relationship between the economy and nature here. So I really, sorry, I really appreciated that um, you know, kind of naturalizing the global economy side is also kind of making nature part of that economy. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. uh, you know, it feels like it's taking on this very naturalized role, 
and the people in the front are a little bit not like players in that world. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering if like, do you see this as an economic story about nature and not the story about the economy, or is that question even like wrong? No, the, the question is essential and, and, and unanswerable. I mean, I think our economy is, a, is, a, is the, the, the endeavor of our instinct, right? Yeah, well, and I won't go far as to say that. I will say that there is obviously something um, about profit that is uh, not, not, not profit for the need, not the way these people are profiting from the river to take their fish home, but about profit in general that has, uh, you know, that we have followed into this, you know, uh, Anthropocene, you know, this time where profit is actually the most important natural force on our planet. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, I think it would be that would take a philosopher or a, or a, a evolutionary biologist philosopher. Maybe Peter Singer can answer that one. But but um, yeah, that's yes, and I don't know. <laughs> yes, and I don't know. <laughs> All right, thank you, guys. <laughs>